when we looked at the exhibition this afternoon uh, together, we made a tour together, Elena made the suggestion that maybe it's good uh, before we actually talk about the exhibition that I briefly resume what's the plot of the project, because may maybe not everybody of you had had a chance to, to uh, look through it, because it's a fairly condensed scenario, which we didn't, I mean, explain um, in any exaggerated fashion didactically um, with respect to the artist and the curiosity of the viewers. Um, but it might be good actually to, to do that before we actually start uh, in the discussion. This project actually is an experiment about what Switzerland looks like. And I think the most important um, precondition of the entire uh, work was the, the fact that Pierre-Philippe Hoffmann has roots in Switzerland. He's born and raised in Belgium, but he has ancestors in Switzerland, in Olten. And he was always curious about what um, Switzerland actually looks like. He knew that it was vaguely different than Belgium, being a flat country, uh, finding its opposite here with a lot of alpine topography. So there was always a kind of distant longing how, how this landscape actually works and how, how it is uh, set up. What is important to understand about this project is that it's, um, it is a conceptual setup. Um, in German, we would say a Versuchsanordnung, which consisted of the idea of making 10 walks, 10 long hikes from the borders of Switzerland all around the perimeter of the country towards the center, the geographical center, which is a place called Egealp. And <clears throat> he made these walks, which altogether are 2,700 kilometers long, and made one thing which is absolutely important for this, for this entire setup. He made the decision to take a video camera with himself, and after each kilom kilometer of walking, he would do a short film with the camera, put on a tripod for about a minute. This is important because it basically relieves the artist of the question of choice, what place to, to, uh, um, to portray. This rule basically decided which places, which parts of the Swiss territory would be immortalized in these little videos and it created a quasi-scientific mapping, because you define a, so, a sort of objective rule, and then you follow that rule, and in the end, you study the results of this. So it's, I think it's a really interesting scenario, because it basically detaches the artist from a kind of compositional approach, where he or she would have the power to basically decide which parts of Switzerland you consider worthy of being shown. He didn't do that. The rule of the one kilometer, um, um, or, or one film per one kilometer, basically produces a set setup in which you automatically produce uh, videos, whether or not the motive that you can actually see would be considered normally image worthy. So you find banal, heroic um, motifs juxtaposed very easily, and um, you as a viewer can decide or can actually understand the, f the sequence and the frequency of iconic moments that structure the experience of the landscape of Switzerland. And this is, I think, the scientific, the quasi-scientific approach of this, uh, of this work, because it gives you a type of x-ray of the Swiss territory that is very hard to produce for yourself, because you have to do a lot of walking. It took him four years, 112 walks uh, altogether, and a lot of editing. Now, the, what, what is really interesting about the whole project, to me, is that it has this interesting tension between um, this kind of objective look and the impossibility to actually quantify and interpret this information perfectly because as you can see we cannot 
to understand where these places are that we see in the videos. There is not a legend. It, there's no credit. It doesn't tell us this place is there. So we're left in the dark. At the same time, there's this monumental table that you've seen where all the videos are actually being catalogued. It's probably the longest Excel sheet in history, at least in my understanding. And you see literally all 2,700 videos being indexed according to a series of parameters. So that you know as a visitor, actually, it's, each video could be perfectly localized, but the artist chose not to tell you. And so in that sense, we know there's a lot of information out there. We cannot access it, and the only thing that we can do is to rely upon our own experience. And this, this kind of twist of a seemingly concept art setup, it seems to be a concept art work of art, and in the end, a project that prioritizes on the experience and the phenomenology of the landscape that you can see is, I think, what, what really interested me in this project, because we basically have to trust our senses and our experiences. And we understand that all the information that is so sophisticatedly laid out is actually out of reach and doesn't help us to come to make sense of this work. So maybe that's as a, as a brief little introduction, because it's, it takes some time to actually go through the, through the exhibition and put all the pieces together. And in order so that we can shortcut this, I, I thought it's, it's, it's good we can jump this phase over. Now, Elena, you've seen this work uh, today um, for the first time in depth, and we discussed about it largely. And of course, I'm really interested in how you perceive this from your point of view as an um, art curator, how you place it in the, in the history of contemporary art, and um, yeah, what, it, what it brought you as inspiration. Um, hello, is this on? Yes. So one of the things that most fascinated me is that it, it seemed clear that Pierre Philippe was, in a way, the very contemporary extension of a, contem of a conceptual art legacy. And there are a number of examples that we can think of. Um, it's, there's an artist named Richard Long, who's known for having taken walks. And the work that you would see would be the photograph of the trampled grass that he walked on between two points. And there would be kind of documentation and this dry, black and white conceptual document that's left over. Or someone like Stanley Brown, who would give you a a white piece of paper that would have the name of the city and would have the, the place um, that he made a walk upon. So there's this idea that conceptual art is dry, it's full of facts, it's um, objective, mm -hmm. um, and in the, on the one hand, the protocol that you've used to make this project is, is inheriting that legacy. Um, you have a strict set of rules, and you've laid out some of them, but there are even still others, rules that are followed. But there's something maddening and absurd about the way you went about this project. And I'm really interested in that moment when the dryness of conceptual art meets the impossibility or absurdity um, that for me is actually very Belgian, um, a kind of sly humor, black humor almost. Could you say something about this legacy and your own position in relation to it? Yeah, I think it was pretty uh, well said, uh, but uh, it's true that there's some uh, Belgian aspect in, in my work. I, I, I may not uh, say it, it, it wouldn't be uh, the case, but uh, I've also seen that uh, Harald Seemann, for, for instance, uh, made, made, uh, was really inter fascinated by Belgium and by Swiss because they all have this kind of, uh, of, uh, of um, approach. Uh, on one side, the Belgian guy is, is maybe a, a bit mad, a bit uh, full of disorder, and, and looks for uh, rationality, uh, a kind of uh, putting order back to, to what <coughs> he, he has in mind. And in, in Switzerland, it's the opposite. The, the, the context is so pure, it's, it's full of order, and the artist what, wants to, to get some free freedom in it. And so there is uh, a good connection between the, these two 
countries that look for, for a kind of uh, compromise between the two attitudes. Uh, that's what uh, Harald Seyman learned learn, uh, learn me uh, with uh, his uh, Belgic visionnaire and, uh, and Swiss uh, visionnaire. visionary. Yeah. Can I, kind of connected to that, can I ask you something about choice? Because Andreas has made the point that through this protocol, you walked, you defined the, the parameters. You, you start at a, the edge of the country, you go towards the center, you make a walk, and every kilometer you're taking a photograph. So certain decisions are, are not yours. A they video. Are, they're they're a decided. Video. A video. He takes a video. A video. A video. Yeah. But where, you know, once you stop at a kilometer, what you choose to to make a video of, whether it's in front of you or to the side, how you compose the image, that is a choice, right? Indeed, everything is a choice. Uh, the, the, the question of uh, objectivity uh, is an old one uh, re regarding the context of photography, of course. So, so the concept is already one choice. But making an image is, for me, something quite natural also. As a photographer, I'm, I'm used to, to, to make images uh, where, where whatever the situation is. Uh, so if I have a context, I must make a picture and it's possible to frame it so it, it looks like a picture, even if there's no subject. So uh, it, it's, it, it's a kind of legacy again to, to make picture wh wherever it's possible. And, and I like to play uh, in, within the context of, of this uh, research with lots of uh, references to photography, to photographers, to way the, the way documentary is. There, there is also, uh, uh, sometimes it's difficult to, to see if a picture is uh, whether um, a document or a, a piece of art. So this is already a question that exists since the year uh, 70 or, or 80. And, and I like to play with uh, all different uh, kind of framing of aesthetics. Uh, I, I see a, a picture there that, that looks maybe like uh, Ansel Adams, uh, who is not known for documentary, but uh, more aesthetic uh, views of, uh, of landscapes. Uh, there we can have uh, Alfred Stiglitz with the equi equivalence, the, the images of, of clouds. And there are uh, a lot of references also to, to uh, Bernte und Ila Becher, Thomas Struth, or, or pretty uh, famous names. And what I like to do is, is to feel free to compose images uh, as, as I like them to, to be, because I know it's, it's a small part in a huge ocean of images. So uh, the quantity will make the work more objective. But uh, every single image has no weight, uh, in fact, for me. Uh, so did that answer to, you, to your question? I'd like to press on in the same direction a little bit. How big was the temptation to embellish a boring place with your skills as an artist? To, uh, I didn't to, em to em it, it's, the, it's the idea of choice that Eleanor was referring to. So radically, if you basically say, I, I make do with what I see, yeah. no matter whether it's the Matterhorn or some generic point in the landscape, um, did you feel a temptation to restore a notion of sublime beauty or whatever to places that seemed to lack all those qualities by nature? I think I, I wouldn't speak about uh, this this definition of sublime. Sublime mm. is for me uh, refers to, to more to philosophy. Sublime is is a, is a, uh, talks not about the aesthetic, not about the beauty, but about the the size of the elements. And it's more a romantic view that I, I want to give. That's that's fine. Then forget yeah, about the sublime. Yeah. Uh, did but you feel an urge to fight the banal? Um, no, I think. Uh, what, what I seek is normality. How can I de describe a country? I made it in Belgium and I do it uh, now in, uh, in Switzerland. How can I portrait a landscape? Mm. How can I uh, uh, show all the situations that we could mm -hmm. meet? 
uh, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, everybody meets every every kind of images we we are facing here. Mm -hmm. But putting them together, that's where the the works uh, add his its value, I think. Because in fact, you made the decision as well that you wanted to portray in this portrait of, of Switzerland, you wanted to portray every kind of weather, every kind of uh, region, um, every kind of, I mean, you, what were the other cri sets of criteria you uh, used? The altitudes, the canton, the, the weather, the, did I say the typologies? all these uh, questions, but did this came afterwards. It, it was not my aim to, to have, yeah, it was my aim to, to have all variations, but that's when I <coughs> built the, the, the database that I put these categories and say, ah, I could also uh, work with the altitude and, uh, and so uh, I was, when I walk, walked, I was not uh, asking myself, uh, yeah, try to have more views on uh, these altitudes, because we are, we have uh, not so many images at, at this uh, this point. So it, it was not like this. It was afterwards that every everything was categorized. So maybe it's interesting for for the audience that you would give a, a kind of summary of your process. Once you had made the decision, you're going to start from a particular place and go to the center. What does a day for you look like? Um, I, I had different uh, artist residences that, that gave me the, the opportunity to, to have uh, uh, different uh, starting points in, in Switzerland. Um, first of all, I was in Stein am Rhein, then in Solothurn. Uh, I was in Wallis, in Romain Moutier, and, uh, and elsewhere, I don't remember this. Uh, yeah, and, and again in Wallis, but uh, another residence. But this gave me the, the opportunity to, to, to make all the works in the same region, and I tried to vary uh, the season. So I, I, I made Wallis, for example, in, in the summer and in the winter. So I have two different aspects. Um, wh what was the question again? <laughs> Uh, ah, yeah. Uh, how, do, how do I organize my, myself? Yeah, so every every day, uh, no, every evening, uh, I try to 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 organize myself for the the, the day coming, uh, regarding the, the schedule of the trains, uh, the the time of flight we have, of daylight we we can have uh, uh, according to the season, and also the the, the kind of weather uh, I can face. Because uh, when I started in, the, in 2012 in Stein am Rhein, I was walking uh, I, uh, near uh, Altdorf, I think, and uh, it was impossible to, to climb uh, a small portion, for example, uh, 200 meters, because it was full of snow, and uh, and and I learned to to uh, to organize myself to avoid this kind of situation, and so I was not um, continuing my. Uh, a single road. I will. Uh, I, I was walking each day a small fragment of different uh, road uh, route together. So it was kind of a huge puzzle. Uh, yeah. To make sure that you would finish the yeah, whole yeah, line yeah, yeah, somehow. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I checked. I checked it every every day. I, so I wake up early, around the, sometimes draw, uh, around five in the morning. I take the. The, the train around 6.30, I go to a starting point, I arrive there at, uh, at 9, and then I walked uh, for 6 or 7 hours, depending to the season, and then I go back, and so, so you, you lose a lot of uh, time in the, in the train, which gave me the opportunity to sleep a bit further. So <laughs> it was good. Details. Yeah, and, and then when, when you come back, it's, it's already 10 in the evening, and you need to, to, uh, to uh, make a backup of what you filmed, organize yourself, and prepare the next day with a map, uh, how long will I walk uh, with, a, with a special uh, software to, to have a, a good approximation of, of the time needed to, to make some, some connections, check up uh, everything, the weather. That, so it, it was really... Uh, dance every, every walk. So that was my organization. And, but you also gave yourself on certain days certain kinds of challenge. 
Like one day you told yourself you want to walk as long as physically possible for a day. Yeah, that uh, that was uh, just at the beginning because <laughs> I, I had th this crazy idea to 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 follow some straight lines, and uh, I I wanted to to know if this project was bearable. W was it possible for me to 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 do it? I was not trained, and so the the first day I I tried to to find uh, some. Uh, language uh, with the images. Uh, is it possible to film everywhere I, I, I will come? It was possible and uh, the, the, the second day I, I tried to, to walk as much as I, as I could, about uh, yeah, 35 kilometers uh, during one day. And, uh, and then, yeah, it was okay. So I was ready if I, if I, I, I was able to, to measure how long I, I could uh, walk during one day and I could have an idea about how many days it would need to, to make the whole project. But I was totally wrong. It was more. <laughs> of course. Yeah. I, I was wondering when I saw the, uh, the films, why do you see so little cities? I mean, so few cities. That, that's uh, reality. You know, I, I chose line and, uh, lines and, and sometimes I cross cities and the cities are, are not so big. The, the big cities in, in Switzerland are uh, maybe Basel, Geneva, Zurich and the rest are... Uh, they are pretty small cities, so... But did you try to bypass those no, cities? No, no, I passed through. If, yeah. if my way were through, uh, we have images uh, in uh, Geneva, Sion, uh, no, not Bern. Not uh, Basel? Uh, no, 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 Aro. But, <sighs> but, but it, it, it's pretty fast, you know. A, a city is, is about uh, 10 kilometers, so we have... 10 images of one city, mm -hmm. uh, not more. So, so uh, yeah, it, it's also about measuring uh, time mm -hmm. and space, this, this project. And, and so, yeah, the, a city is pretty in, insignificant in, 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 in such a, a country uh, built up around landscape. Yeah. So Switzerland is as unurban as it seems to be in this project. Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in, if, if we can uh, make a comparison, uh, Belgium is, is, uh, is, is smaller and we have uh, 10 million inhabitants. Here it's, it's a bit bigger and we have uh, 8 million uh, mm -hmm. inhabitants. I, I think it, it, it makes a difference. And, and Belgium is, is really densely... Uh, 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 yeah. Populated. Uh, yeah, populated. Mm -hmm. And so you, you have the impression of never getting out the city. Mm -hmm. you, 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 you leave a city and another one is already starting, so you, you all, you're never alone. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in Switzerland, it's quite easy to feel alone, even if there are lots of other walkers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I actually have a question for both of you, in a way. Um, and it's a question <coughs> that I, I almost asked rhetorically because I... I think I know the answer, but it's useful to, to discuss it. Like being in a Swiss architecture museum, for me, one of the things that have defined and excited me most about your tenure, your arrival here as, as director, has been that you make an audience completely rethink what an exhibition of architecture can or should be, or how we can um, look at an exhibition and understand the implications for built life, um, urban, you know, just even the fact of understanding Switzerland is not a place, as urban a place as we might otherwise imagine it to be. Mm. Um, so I, it's more a comment and a question. Mm. Was it obvious to you when you learned of this project that this made sense in a Swiss architecture museum and has there been questions about that because I'm excited to see such an exhibition here but I wonder if some diehard architects might feel like but this is not architecture. Mm -hmm. Yeah that's an interesting question. For me this museum is defined by two concepts. It's the fact that it's an architecture museum and it's the fact that it's a Swiss museum and that it's a museum about Switzerland in some way uh, using one strata of physical manifestation, such as architecture, to index this place. Um, when, when I heard about uh, Pierre Philippe's project, I had the feeling this is an exhibition that allows us to continue our exploration of the term Swiss. What is Swiss and what is Swiss in relationship to an architecture museum? 
it connected very well to uh, the first exhibition that I have done here, the, the Schweizweit show, which was the attempt to make an X-ray of the architectural production in this whole country, which has not been done for some time, because the architecture scene in Switzerland is more locally organized. There are local architectural scenes in various cities and regions. But not so often will you see an examination that puts together and in relationship what people do in Ticino, in the French Switzerland, and, and here, for instance. So this is one of my main focus to understand <coughs> What could this architecture museum contribute to the discourse of architecture in Switzerland that maybe other institutions cannot so easily do? And this is the only place that is dedicated to the dissemination of architecture with this attribute Swiss in its name. So therefore, I think we have a certain obligation to, to look at the whole thing and to check out what is the common denominator between all these various practices in this whole country. Given the fact that Switzerland has a culture that is very locally, um, let's say, inspired, uh, people maintain a lot that it matters immensely where you do something, and that the place inspires the logic of the work that you do. And so the question is really, well, what connects these various places, if they're all done, uh, or these various projects? Uh, or practices, if they're all being carried out at different places. And I think one of the connecting forces is this insistence on the, on the idiosync uh, idiosyncrasy of what you do in a specific place. And in some way, what everybody agrees on in Switzerland is that everybody is very different. And this difference can create a new type of coherence, because it starts on a basic understanding of, um, of, let's say, the value of a local practice that has its own legitimation in its own autonomy. That's, for instance, different to a culture like France, with its own centralist understanding of how the state and the culture works, where clearly Paris is the center in any kind of sense, and whatever else is produced anywhere else, it cannot be considered but a derivation of the authority of the production of the center. And this is very different in Switzerland. This, uh, the center here has no authority. People you know, smile when they hear Bern um, in the sense of, well, you don't tell us what we do. We do what we want to do. And out of this kind of parallelity of approaches, arises a quilt of artistic and architectural practices which produces a really interesting coherent pattern without being master planned by anybody. And for me, this project puts this kind of, let's say, this kind of connected autonomous production um, very beautifully in form because you see different places all over and somehow in a very difficult way to put this into words, this seems to be connected. It's not autistic, it's related, but based upon the conviction of um, an idiosyncratic uh, founding of what, whatever you do. And this can be found in the landscape, it can be found in the culture of the space, and it can be found in the way that artists and architects and other creative people produce work in this country. So for me, the the unique challenge and the unique um, specificity of Switzerland is the fact that you can understand here there may be the notion of a collectivity that isn't defined by one central idea, but by the coexistence of many. And the possibility that this coexistence, coexistence is not considered or perceived as chaotic or unrelated, but somehow bound together by, by a certain kind of, um, that's kind of difficult to say, by, by a certain kind of commitment to still be Switzerland. <laughs> and that's why I think this exhibition is perfect. 
for, for the project of the Swiss Architecture Museum that I have here, which is really to define this, what Robert Venturi once described beautifully in this term, the difficult whole. You know, it's, a, it's a very beautiful term from his book, uh, Contradiction in um, Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture, where he makes a critique of the modernist understanding of architecture and the city, which was trying to define a good idea to follow by everybody. And it created some kind of totalitarian regime. Um, <clears throat> he, by difference, and this is what sparked the idea of postmodern culture, had the idea of maybe we can produce a whole without a homogenization of differences. And this, for me, is what I see in Switzerland. This is what maybe Europe, for instance, could inspire itself today from Switzerland. The idea of a whole where you can collide together to some kind of a larger system of agreement without having the feeling to giving up your own individuality. And the moment in the political discourse of Europe we see, unfortunately, the opposite. We see that the, the nation state uh, from the 19th century researches in importance when we almost believed it was over. Unfortunately, it isn't. So people think it's important, again, to state your national identity as something ex excluding others. And so for me, I always think that Switzerland is a kind of micro-Europe. It kind, it's an incubating laboratory of what Europe could be with its interesting system of cantonal self-determination that create as much coherence with each other only as much as it is necessary so that they can keep the rest for their kind of cultivation of their autonomy. And <clears throat> I see this project by Pierre-Philippe as, um, as an amazing visualization of a territorial whole that is composed of anything but differences. Does this make sense? It, it does, it does yeah. actually, because now, I mean, I, I realized as you were speaking, here we are three non-Swiss people, <laughs> three foreigners speaking about our impressions of Switzerland. Mm. But in, through this process, Pierre-Philippe, you've become in some ways a certain kind of expert on the topic because you might be the only uh, certainly Swiss person I know who will have physically walked like in every single sort of canton from the edge to the center in every kind of weather and, and, and documented it. Yeah, probably in a, in a sense, but um, lots of people are walking through Switzerland every day, uh, more than in uh, every other country. Uh, yeah. Spaziergänger is, is a thing here. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've, I've met some, some Swiss people uh, that said, yeah, your project remind me when I, five years ago I decided to, to quit my job for one year and I walked through Switzerland. So I'm not the only person who made it, but... They, they wanted to have a, an aesthetic view of the country, which was not my case. They, they wanted to, to, to see uh, Rigis and then uh, Materon and, and uh, the most famous places, which was not my aim. I was uh, just walking through and I, I put attention on, on uh, every uh, parking place and uh, every, everything. Uh, so that's uh, that's the difference. But talking about the 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 the, the subject you you you, you were uh, you were talking uh, some minutes ago, I I, I would say also that there there is a, a huge difference be between uh, Belgium and Switzerland, for for example. Of course. Yeah. Uh, uh, I made a similar project in in, in Belgium, and I, I was facing uh, purely architectural uh, project everywhere. Uh, did, it doesn't uh, say that that is good architecture, but everybody tries to have his own personal house and will make some, uh, some uh, experiment or try something new, which is at the end absolutely ugly. But every single house is an architecture uh, project Statement. because mm. you need an architect to build a house in, in, in Belgium and in most of countries. And in Switzerland, it's not the case. 
it's not needed. You, 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 have to, uh, you need someone to check that everything will be okay. Is it okay with the city? You can build it. Also, everybody own. can call him or herself an architect in Switzerland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not and, a protected And, and that's the difference. And that's the reason why there, there's also more coherence, because everybody wants the, the house of the neighbor uh, and, and doesn't want to lose the, the view of, uh, of the mountains. And so he take also in, in consideration the, the fact that it's uh, in the center of a landscape. So the context mm -hmm. is, is central. Mm -hmm. He, he won't build his house uh, and, and, uh, and make lose some landscape to, to his neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is more urbanism than architecture in that way because the, 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 the community uh, view is more important than, than the single person. Mm -hmm. And in Belgium, in France, it's the opposite. Everybody was his own things and check at the, at the municipality, is it okay if I make a, a structure like this? And, and the, the city say, no, it's not allowed. Okay, I won't do it. And they, they, they make a huge wall, a, a huge fence with vegetables, and they do it. <laughs> so that's the way uh, they mm -hmm. do it in other countries. And mm -hmm. I, I think it's more Germanic uh, or uh, English or Swiss to, to respect the, the view of the landscape. Uh, it's also part of the law in Switzerland. The yeah, landscape yeah. has to be protected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what, what I... Uh, so I, I was not fascinated about ar architecture in Switzerland. Of, of, of course, there are uh, amazing projects, but these are public... Uh, yeah, public buildings are huge things uh, by uh, Jean Nouvel, Herzog, and De Moron. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, I was not, not amazed about that, but more about the way everything is uh, thought within the context of a city, for example. There, there are ways indicated everywhere. So if you need to go to the marketplace of the church, it's 15 minutes, and you, you walk this direction, and there is a, a, a tunnel going uh, under the road and then up to the uh, to, to the rail station and everything is, is thought. And in Belgium, it's the contrary. We build a house and say, "Oh, we forgot about the cars and the and the bicycle." And uh, oh, it's too late. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so uh, that's uh, the the huge difference for me. And so, it, it uh, this work maybe doesn't talk for, for myself about architecture, but about the way uh, every public situation is, is something in common with all the others and, and with a kind of uh, respect, you know, mm -hmm. I would say. I would like to ask the architects in the room um, about what they learned or um, discovered in this installation. Anything? Heinrich, would you like to say something? I come from the place uh, Alkiol, very close. Really? Yes, so I, I think I, I know some places you, you have images, uh, images of. And uh, <clears throat> yes, I, I think uh, it's part of my, of my country uh, here and I see, yes, it's uh, most places they are it's just a, a get this way by, by accident. It's, uh, yes, it just became like this. And they are, maybe you like them, maybe you, you think they are ugly. I think you picked the, the nice pictures uh, as you, you have chosen uh, yeah, the view. I, I think you have also could look the, the opposite way and it would be something completely different. Uh, so I was wondering uh, how how long is your was your distance uh, for the kilometer? Did you exactly the kilometer, or uh, and you stayed there and just made like this? Uh, I think you you have a, a little spread or a wide spread in in choosing the better image. That, that's right. Uh, in this work, it's it's kind of measurement between what I look for and, and what I uh, physically uh, feel. And if I feel one kilometer, it's one kilometer. Uh, I, I want it, it, 
it's pretty elastic, but but it's still correct. It's, uh, I measure kilometers by, of course, I have a, a GPS with me, but it's it's hard to to say uh, with the GPS, and it's almost between every uh, 15 and, and 20 minutes that I make uh, a video. So sometimes I go faster or slower, but it's like this. So it's ah, oh, it might be time for a new video. I stop and I, I choose, but it's not, oh, let's go to this point and maybe I will see this and, and make the video. It's not like this, but uh, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's the way I proceed. Mm -hmm. So th there is a kind of uh, elasticity, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's maybe one thing that hasn't been brought up yet, which I find very fascinating also about this project, which is full of a certain number of decisions that are made, a certain number of things where I think you're very right about choice and, and the elasticity, but also the algorithm. Could you say something about the algorithm that determines what we see? Because that is not your choice. No, no, this is pretty central and we, we didn't talk about this yet. So every video is collected in a huge database with this show there. It's six meters long, it's quite impossible to read but it's even more impossible to write. So it <laughs> took ages to do it. So I'm just looking at all the videos takes 40 hours, but to write them and to describe all of this, it's two months uh, just in front of, of a, 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 screen. a kind of boring video sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so it, 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 it's, um, yeah, and, and with the database, I asked to a, a, dev, a web developer to, to build up uh, uh, in PHP uh, an algorithm system that would uh, make score for a certain amount of screen. I have chosen to, to make the exhibition of, uh, on uh, uh, 72 screens. And so the algorithm say, well, we have this amount of screens on on a specific moment, after three minutes or every minute, we want to have all the videos with all kind of weather, all kind of uh, seasons, altitudes, typologies, uh, and so on. And, and so the algorithm uh, decide uh, for me what to show. And so uh, that's pure, purely theoretic because it was not, uh, the, the algorithm system was developed and then uh, I followed this discord and, and then I remarked, yeah, we have a train here and then <coughs> the, the one minute later, the screen just uh, next to, to this one is also showing a train. It might be a problem. So I readjust all the things. So we, we don't have this kind of situations. And it took uh, three more weeks just to change numbers in my score. So, so it was, uh, so, it's always me and, and the system. Uh, we are fighting uh, permanently in, in, the, in this work. Which so is a bit like there's an Excel sheet on the wall, yeah. and the wall which is yeah. directly in the back, which defines each of the screens, yeah. and then each of the file numbers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's almost like you know, spy code. Um, and for each minute, but you, if you look closely at it, you see at a certain moment, there's one film that plays for two minutes. Yeah, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's an exception. And I, I, uh, it's my freedom in, in that work and in my own system to, to say, oh, this is quite boring. I like this video, let's put it. And I could have uh, hide th this on, on, uh, on the score. If I would have put the number twice in two different columns, nobody would have seen it. But I, I chose to, to put it just in, in between the two columns, so there is a problem for everybody. It's not, uh, <laughs> so, so it, it's a personal choice because uh, yeah, the video is happening there. It's a, it's a little kid uh, in front of a, a migro in Porrentruy, Pruntrout. And he tries to open a, a, a bottle of uh, Rivella or I don't know. So her, he, he's going out of the Migro and uh, her mother lets him with all the, the things they bought. And she goes to catch the, the car. And it, it lasts for yeah, a, a long time. And during the, the, the whole time, the kid is trying to open, it, to open the, the bottle. So he tries, 
doesn't work, if the P doesn't work, and then somebody is passing just next to him and he hides the bottle like, no, oh, I can open this bottle. And so the, the, the people just uh, go out of the, the frame and he tries again and it lasts two minutes like this. And so this is quite a, yeah, it's a, it's a narrative video in, in this, uh, in this uh, setup and I chose to, to, to let things happen during two minutes. So that's my exception. I'd like to ask uh, something to uh, some architect friends from Zurich, um, Stefan Mattea, who have just made recently a hike through Switzerland, I understand, so you're perfectly qualified to um, analyze this kind of situation. The, um, the, uh, the, the, the critic of the uh, NZZ subtitled her review of, of this show with this phrase, an artist hikes through Switzerland, his video diary uh, introduces the banality of the Swiss everyday and produces at times depressions. What do you think may be the cause of those depressions? <laughs> <clears throat> or do you share that experience, first of all? Well, mm, well I, I guess there would be other reasons to get a depression in Switzerland, but that's not... <clears throat> no, I don't share this experience at all. Um, of course, I, it's, it's, it's difficult to say. I don't share this experience, that's for sure. Um, even if things are banal or might, might be even, um, if you look at them isol uh, isolated, it, some things could be depressing. But I think the sheer sum makes, makes out of it completely something different. And I don't think it's about the individual um, at least it doesn't, to me, it doesn't occur like this, the individual... The, the only thing where I could sort of share the, 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 the no, notion of depression is, is yeah, I had quite often the experience, oh, I know this, I know where it is, and then it turns out by, you see three cars with the same canton on the license plate, and you mean, okay, no, I was completely wrong. Mm -hmm. But that's a little bit depressive, not because I was wrong, but because then there is certain things which, wherever you are, they look the same, and it's not the nice things which look the same. But again, I've read this review as well, and I actually I was I didn't agree. <laughs> um, and I well, I, at the point I didn't I didn't agree because I haven't seen I couldn't say something because I haven't seen the exhibition yet. I saw it today for the first time, and um, still I don't agree with this uh, notion of depression. I think it it can have something very um, relaxing hiking uh, through Switzerland uh, in, in this manner, if you do it yourself. Of course, we didn't do this 2,700 kilometers kind of thing. We just went for a week and went somehow very classical Swiss hiking in the mountains thing. But um, this non-spectacular thing sort of, that I think that is also a quality. You were mentioning this the Belgian style of architecture, this everybody is shouting, I have the nicest, uh, uh, fanciest house. And then looking away from this and just seeing and letting come all the things can have something very relaxing and non depressing. <coughs> it, can, it can also free your mind sometimes, I think. <coughs> it cleans out a little bit. Would you say that the architecture with a capital A is. A little bit too absent. Switzerland is known as the architectural country in the world with the highest density of good quality architecture. You don't see that much here, do you? Or is that a truthful representation of the actual percentage of good quality architecture within the whole built environment of this country? I think this also has to do with the, with the setup. I mean, as you mentioned, um, if you walk through Aarau, it's like eight, nine kilometers, um, and you probably won't go uh, along the museum and stuff like this. Or you would, uh, because that's not the places would, which are on the line you initially said you're gonna walk. So, um, I think the, the architecture with a capital A is, is quite present in urban environments. As soon as you get out of the suburbs or even further out, it's basically what we see here. 
So if you just make a cut through a country and say that's where I walk through, then you happen to, to meet it or not. I mean, you could, with the same reason, you could say there is not, a, there not many, that many gas stations. <laughs> you see, um, because no, it was they were just not on that line. Um, and I think it's not only the architecture with a capital A which represents um, the a country or a landscape or a region, and probably we could also think. Uh, find some things which are maybe not nice, definitely not architecture with a capital A, but also done in a very um, subtle and um, precise manner. And that's what they share and I think that's also what the, this architecture in Switzerland profits off a little bit, this, uh, that there is a lot, uh, enough money to build carefully and all these things. So there, there is they share something, some of these uh, things I've seen. Did you want to comment on this? Or? Yeah, maybe uh, going on with the landscape also. I have the impression that landscape in Switzerland is technically, technically thought. Everything is managed under control. There's no... Uh, exception. Uh, yeah, there's no exception in, in a purely a wild country because uh, with this kind of typology it's is, is, is a huge challenge to, to keep the domination and uh, this, is, this is amazing in Switzerland because uh, in, in our flat country in Belgium yeah, we didn't manage uh, we even didn't try <laughs> and, and so that's uh, uh, that's pretty uh, interesting in Switzerland everything is a thought uh, there is a plan for everything, even uh, even uh, a path uh, for walker. Uh, for walker, there will be a dustbin every 500 uh, uh, meters. It will be uh, it will it it will be uh, built. So, yeah. Did you sense this as a source of joy, this amount of control, or uh, as a little bit of a it's paranoia? Double. It's double. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, there, there's no uh, um, um, natural, uh, n naturally created uh, landscape. Mm -hmm. uh, every everything is is out of of the heads of of someone or of a uh, of a collectivity. But it's also really comfortable also to to enjoy this and and to feel secure wherever you you are. So it's 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 a double uh, mm -hmm. aspect. Okay, of course. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, I keep coming back to this question of choice, but it's because I'm so impressed by how you manage this tension between a certain set of rules and a certain lack of rules in the sense of already just this experience of being in the talk, sometimes you realize there's an eruption from one screen or another, you don't know which, of sound. That suddenly some of them actually have sound and some are black and white and some are in color, although if we think of conceptual art, we think it's, it's usually black and white and boring and dry. And you've made a sensual, experiential, um, unpredictable version. Yeah, for me it's a really a combination between pleasure and conceptual art. Conceptual art needs to be radical. Uh, as we, we said earlier uh, when we met uh, this afternoon, uh, in the year 60, somebody would have written on the wall, I made this, I took pictures, and they, bur they are burning in the garden, I don't show you. <laughs> so that, that's, uh, that's how we, we did it uh, 50 years ago. And I think, is it still useful to, to, to redo it like this? It, it, it's kind of, uh, yeah, still interesting, it's a radical point of view, but I want it also to enjoy and to, to take pleasure. Uh, and so it's, it's a compromise uh, be between, uh, between both attitudes, you, you know. And, and um, th this choice of having some images in, in white and black and in color is, is a way to, to catch the attention of the viewer also. If I put all the images in black and white, this would be quite radical and conceptual. 
we, we, we remove the pleasure of, uh, of, color. Uh, of color. And if I put everything in color, it might be conceptual as well. I didn't do anything on the images. I just uh, let them uh, be as they are. And I choose to, to, to put some of them in black and white, some in color, just to, to catch the attention. Uh, most of the images are in black and, and white, and it's, uh, it's a way to, to make the, the, this work more digest also, to, to have a, a kind of order. But the, the way uh, color is, is, is coming out, catch the attention and say, oh, there's more to see here. And so uh, I will stop uh, looking at this video and I walk there. Oh, but there's sound somewhere, somewhere, somewhere else. So it's kind of uh, permanent frustration that gives you the, the need of walking through the exhibition. But already as a tourist uh, who is walking through landscape, you know, uh, if you turn left, you won't see what, ha what will happen if, if you have turn, had turned right. And so it's a question of, of choice. To see something is, is uh, accepting the, the fact that you won't see the other thing correctly. So that's, that's the, the way we experience uh, this kind of installation. And that's the way color and sound uh, are useful for my work. Are there any other questions from the audience? Here's one. I have a question concerning this paper, yeah. which was handed over on the entrance, and I'm just um, asking myself, is this a kind of diary, or what yeah. kind of is it, or, or what is otherwise, which is kind of controversial to this mapping idea, if yeah. you mean? And then, and then I, when I would have done this, I, I often think I would be tempted to, to lose the track. I would be like, like Walter Benjamin once said, like he's looking for to getting lost. Somewhere. Here you never have the uh, you never have the idea. Okay, now I I go away from my <coughs> strict mapping idea. And here in this diary, or it seems to be like diary. I feel like you have now sometimes you try to get away from this very but strict. <laughs> We, yeah, it's part of the the, the work because it, it, it's kind of document on the work, but it, it's separate. Uh, it's not a diary because I, I wrote. Personal. Yeah, yeah, but uh, but I wrote it uh, this year, and uh, and the last video I made were uh, two or three years uh, before. The of the stops? Yeah, it's the number of the video concerned, and in fact. Uh, it's, it's a way to, to reread the, the work I was doing. Uh, how, how does the, my own souvenirs work? Uh, what am I able to, to relieve? And, and when I see a video, I, I suddenly have uh, images that, that come out. Uh, and I, I don't know if it's uh, what really happened or or not, and so it's not a diary. It's uh, it's, it's something that that comes afterwards, and, and I like the, the way uh, I speak about uh, my daily thoughts, but some years after. But it's not part of the of the work. It's, uh, that's the reason why it's it's in the headphones, just in in the in the other room, because uh, I I appreciate the fact that you you can uh, listen to it afterwards. First, the installation, and then maybe a second lecture, which is uh, uh, another way to, to dig into the work. Yeah. And how do you feel? I mean, you have to stay in this walk. This is something so tense that you're not like, I, I mean, I look uh, yeah, one day and I'm not following this very much. Yeah, I always have to. No, no. Uh, I, I think uh, it could be cons considered a, as a sport. Uh, performance and, and, uh, and sport can uh, fast become uh, an addiction, you know. When you walk every day, you, it's difficult not to walk. And so this, this was, yeah, if it's hardly rainy, uh, it's a problem for me and I, I didn't stop, uh, I didn't start these days for technical reason. I would have uh, enjoyed to, to show more rain, but there it's, it's impossible to, to film or, 
or the, this kind of thing. But but uh, yeah, it, it was a, it was a kind of addiction to walk every day. And sometimes I have some free time and say, oh, it's Sunday. I don't know what to do. Uh, I, I wanted to go there, but it, it's too far. I won't I, I won't have uh, enough trains. What shall I do? Let's walk. <laughs> I, I did it without camera on. Uh, yeah. Because it, it, it's, it's an addiction. It, it's quite yeah, amazing how, how far you can go uh, into your, your own work and, and your, your discipline also. Uh, when, when you are in, in, a, in a residence, I mean, if you do it seriously, there are some uh, artist residences that are not run uh, seriously and, and so people are just there on holidays. But if you are really in, into your work, you 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 forget to you forget to eat to sleep you 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 lose every notion you say oh it's it's been uh, five days I didn't talk to my uh, daughter let's let let's call her because I totally forget <laughs> uh, and and yeah you are on your own when when you leave your home it's six in the morning and and you turn to, to, to uh, late in the evening so you don't talk to anybody. Uh, of course, when you are in Stein am Rhein or uh, far from the the region where they speak your own language, you don't talk to people. You say "Grüezi" and that's all the whole day. You repeat it a lot of time. Uh, <laughs> Hundred times "Grüezi." And, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, yeah, and and so you 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 learn to to live with yourself, with with your ideas, and uh, and uh, and so that's. A thing that is not shown in the work. Maybe in in this little book it, it gives an idea, but I, I had uh, real uh, yeah uh, problems to solve. Also uh, reflections and about uh, art, about my family, about and when you walk and wh when you are alone, uh, you you cannot avoid them. You cannot say, oh no no. I want to, to think about something else. There is nothing else. You are alone, so if if you if refuse to face a problem, the problem will, will come back afterwards. So so I took a lot of decision. For example, I I uh, I came back to Brussels to say to the girlfriend I, I was living with for 12 years. I think I'm better alone. So let's break up now. <laughs> and I did it. I took my car and I came the the day after. To continue with my, it's quite uh, so, so. You can figure out, yeah, the, the uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of uh, addictive. Yeah, you, you really, it might be dangerous for for some weak people. So I think also to 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 live this kind of uh, permanent uh, endurance and loneliness. But uh, I feel I felt okay, even if if I lost uh, 12 kilos in three months. But <laughs> that was okay. <laughs> Cool. Did you gain them again? Uh, yeah, mm. <laughs> but it took. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah, because uh, yeah, you're totally in it, and uh, yeah, it changed your 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 perception to uh, hunger also, because uh, uh, you have no time to to make some shopping, or so you just eat a banana and uh, and uh, and an iced tea for for one day. It, it's enough. And if you're living in the city with a stress situation, you you enjoy having long meals. You open the fridge uh, ten days, uh, t ten times a day, and uh, and uh, yeah, and this was not necessary. Uh, I figured out, yeah, a banana is enough. It's maybe not healthy, but it's enough uh, when uh, when you consider energy, energy. So it was a surprise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I won't do it again. Okay. <laughs> I think this is a beautiful uh, closing account of the uh, the depth of the experience and the, of the implications that might not be so apparent when just looking at the work. I think it's a very beautiful, uh, let's say, reflection on what this work did to you. Thanks a lot for this um, for this uh, for this extension actually of of this thing. And so I would like to say uh, thank you for this beautiful discussion. Uh, to the two of you. Thanks, uh, Elena, for the co-moderation. It was very nice. Thank you for your um, kind of larger um, uh, discourses. And I would like to make you uh, to remember you that in two weeks' time, exactly today in two weeks' time, on the 6th of September, we have another event here, which is a lecture by 
Philipp Ursprung, who is the head of the Department of Architecture at the ETH Zurich, who is an art historian with a special focus on land art, uh, happening and performance art, and who will do a lecture uh, about this entire artistic, let's say, context out of which this work comes to some extent, in the way that also Elena contextualized it in the beginning. And he'll try to, yeah, to place this type of artistic research within this larger um, field of artistic production that has developed since the 1960s as a kind of critique of the institutional system of art by going outside of the space of the gallery into the space of landscape. And I think this will be a really interesting opportunity to understand this work in a yet more layered network of thoughts. So we, I invite you to, uh, to join our little APRO here and uh, to yeah, lead discussions individually with the artists who will be present. Yeah, I, I wanted to, to thank you also uh, for, your, for your help, for the exhibition, for the talk, uh, for, for you too. And I was sorry to uh, speak in English because uh, my English is not uh, that good as I expected to be. I, I, it would be lots easier in French, but, <laughs> 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 but I managed. I hope you understood. <laughs> Perfectly fine. Okay, thank you.